Hello friends, welcome to my channel Prosto Hub, myself Dr. Jolsna. So today I'm going to discuss the most demanding topic of our channel that is temporomandibular joint disorders and management. So this is a very, very important topic, a must read topic for your exam preparation. Usually this comes as a long essay. It is asked for uh, 75 marks or 100 marks. It can be even asked for 20 marks. So without any delay, let's get into the contents. So the contents include introduction. I'll be discussing the features of TMJ, functional anatomy, biomechanics of TMJ, definition and classification of TMDS, etiology, signs and symptoms, clinical examination and diagnosis, TMJ imaging, management of TMDS, occlusal splints in TMD treatment, and finally conclusion and references. So before getting into detail, I request everyone to please do like and share my videos if you're finding these videos useful. If you're new to this channel, Prostaha, please do subscribe and support me. If you have any queries or feedbacks, you can comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail ID. Introduction. The temporomandibular disorders embrace a wide spectrum of specific and non-specific disorders that produce symptoms of pain and dysfunction of the muscles of mastication as well as TMJs. GPT-9 defines TMDS as conditions producing abnormal, incomplete or impaired function of the temporomandibular joints or the muscles of mastication. And this was first described by Costin and he claimed this to be reflexes because of irritation of the auriculotemporal or the coda tympanic nerves. And this has got similarities to musculoskeletal disorders of other parts of the body. So actually TMDS is a subcategory of orofacial pain disorders. And the greatest issue that we face in managing TMDS is in the proper diagnosis. And it is important for us to rule out disorders that mimic TMD and to offer the patient therapies that will provide the most cost effective as well as long term symptomatic relief. Next, we are going to discuss the features and functional anatomy of temporomandibular joint. So what is the need for knowing the temporomandibular joint before treating TMDS? We know that patient frequently consult a dentist because of pain and dysfunction in the temporomandibular region. And TMDS include myofascial pain, internal derangement, inflammation, dislocation, ankylosis, etc. And in order to treat the TMDS, we should know or we must know the anatomy and physiology of the whole articulatory system of the temporomandibular region. So the temporomandibular articulatory system consists of the masticatory and accessory muscles, the temporomandibular joint and the occlusion of teeth. And as per Jeffrey occasion, nothing is more fundamental to treating patients than knowing the anatomy. So it is very important to know the anatomy of the temporomandibular joint before we are going to discuss TMDS. So coming to the features of TMJ. So TMJ is a very complex joint both morphologically and functionally. So there is coordinated movement of right and left joints which are controlled by reflexes. And TMJ is a synovial joint also called as diarthrosis which is a connection between two bones consisting of a cartilage lined cavity which is filled with a fluid called as the synovial fluid. And temporomandibular joint is actually a highly specialized articulation which is different from other synovial joints in that its articular surfaces are composed of dense fibrous tissue which functions like a cartilage instead of the hyaline cartilage that is usually seen in most of the synovial joints. TMJ is also called as jinglimoarthroidal joint, a term that is derived from jinglimus, meaning a hinge joint, allowing motion only backward and forward in one plane, and arthrodia, meaning a joint which permits a gliding motion of the surfaces. So, the temporomandibular joint consists of two compartments which is separated by an articular disc. The upper compartment allows gliding or sliding movement, and the lower compartment allows hinge movement. So let's see the peculiarities of TMJ again. It's a bilateral diarthrosis that is right and left functioning together. A jinglimo arthroidal joint allowing gliding or sliding movement in the upper compartment and hinge movement in the lower compartment. Articular surfaces is covered by fibrocartilage instead of hyaline cartilage. 
So we said that most synovial joint have hyaline cartilage lining their articulating surfaces. In contrast, the articulating surfaces of the TMJ are lined by dense avascular fibrous connective tissue. And it's the only joint in human body to have a rigid end point of closure. That is the teeth making occlusal contact. So that is the end point of closure of the joint. And in contrast to other diarthroidal joints, TMJ is the last joint to start developing. That is in about 7th week in utero. Next, let's see the functional anatomy of TMJ. So TMJ consists of 6 components. The cranial component, mandibular component, articular disc, TMJ capsule, ligaments and muscular component. So let us see one by one. Coming to the first component, that is the cranial component or the articular surfaces of temporal bone. So, the temporomandibular, also called as craniomandibular articulation, is actually articulation between mandible and the cranium. So, the bony elements in this articulation are the mandibular condyle below and the squamous temporal bones above. So, the cranial surface of TMJ consists of the squamous area of the temporal bone. Another structure here is the articular eminence which is the transverse bar of the dense bone that forms the anterior wall or the anterior limit of the articular fossa. And this articular eminence differ in their inclination among individuals and this difference dictates the path of the condylar movement as well as the degree of rotation of the disc over the condyle. Another structure is the articular tubercle which is a small bony projection situated lateral to the articular eminence. So here it is not an articular surface. Instead it serves as the attachment area for portions of the temporomandibular ligament. So here in this picture you can see this is the mandibular condyle below the squamous area of the temporal bone above. And this is the articular eminence and this differ in their inclination and the articular tubercle is a bony projection that is seen on the lateral surface of the articular tubercle. So this is clear in this picture. So here you can see this is the articular eminence whereas this area is the articular tubercle. Now the concavity within the temporal bone that houses the mandibular condyle is the mandibular fossa or the glenoid fossa or the articular fossa. So this is the concavity within the temporal bone. So this is the articular or glenoid or mandibular fossa. And here the anterior wall as we have already said it is formed by the articular eminence and the posterior wall is formed by the tympanic plate which forms the anterior wall of the external acoustic meatus. Now the bony roof of the glenoid fossa. So here this area is paper thin and it often appears translucent when held against light. So this shows that uh, although the articular fossa contains the articular disc and the condyle, it is not a functionally stress bearing part of the temporomandibular joint. Second component is the mandibular component which consists of mandibular condyle which articulates at the base of the cranium with squamous portion of the temporal bone. Now the condyle is convex in all direction but it's wider mediolaterally than anterior posteriorly. Coming to the third component that is the articular disc which is the most important anatomic structure of the TMJ. Now this is a biconcave fibrocartilaginous structure that is located between the condyle and the temporal bone. It has got a central intermediate zone where blood vessels and nerves are absent and it has got an anterior posterior band. Now because the blood vessels and nerves are absent in the intermediate zone as well as in the avascular fibrous layer that is covering both the mandibular and temporal articular surfaces. This shows that there is considerable reaction force along this portion of the joint. So one of the main function of the articular disc is to distribute the reaction force more evenly along the joint surfaces and thus it reduces stress concentration between the articular surfaces of the condyle as well as the temporal bone. Another function is to accommodate hinging as well as gliding action and it also helps in directing the synovial fluid wherever necessary. 
now it is the articular disc which divides the single joint capsule space of the tmj into an upper compartment that is the superior joint space and a lower compartment that is the inferior joint space and we have already said that it is the gliding or sliding movement that is allowed in the superior joint space that is translation and rotary movement or hinge like movement is allowed in the inferior joint space now in this picture you can see this is the squamous part of the temporal bone this is this black mark that is the superior joint space then the articular disc then inferior joint space and mandibular condyle and uh, anteriorly the disc is attached uh, superiorly to the articular eminence by bending with the tmj capsule and inferiorly is just attached to the anterior condyle so here it is attached to anterior condyle and uh, superiorly it is attached to the eminence and posteriorly it is attached superiorly to the temporal bone and inferiorly to the posterior condyle and you can also see a small portion of the lateral pterygoid muscle is also seen attached to the disc and unlike its anterior and posterior attachment the articular disc is not attached to the capsule laterally or medially instead it is tightly bound directly to the medial and lateral poles of the mandibular condyle so it is these attachment of the disc that help it to helps it to move along with the mandibular condyle coming to the next component that is the fibrous capsule or the tmj capsule so this is a thin sleeve of tissue completely surrounding the joint which extends from the circumference of the cranial articular surface to the neck of the mandible and uh, it has got a reinforcement more laterally by an external tmj ligament so the joint capsule and the temporomandibular ligament function to limit the movements of the mandible so it has got vertical fibers and horizontal fibers the vertical fibers limit distraction movement horizontal fibers prevent excessive retrusive movement posterior portion of the capsule limits protrusive movement and the tmj ligament also limits the distraction and also the posterior movement of the condyle next coming to the temporomandibular ligament complex so there are two types functional ligaments and accessory ligaments and these ligaments they do not stretch but act as passive restraining devices to limit and restrict border movements so first one is the collateral ligament so these are the ligaments seen on each side of the jaw which is designed in two distinct layers that is the medial discal ligament and lateral discal ligament and then comes the capsular ligament we have already discussed the entire tmj is surrounded and encompassed by the capsular ligament third one is the temporomandibular ligament so this reinforces the lateral aspect of the capsular ligament so these have strong tight fibers and it is composed of outer oblique portion and inner horizontal portion the outer oblique portion limits the extent of mouth opening whereas the inner horizontal temporomandibular ligament limits the posterior movement of the condyle the accessory ligament so the first one is the sphenomandibular ligament which extends from the spine of the sphenoid bone and inferiorly in and around the lingula of the mandible so this sphenomandibular ligament limits the distension of mandible in an inferior direction the next one is the stylomandibular ligament which extends from the styloid process of the temporal bone to the posterior margin of the jaw or the angle of the jaw so this one limits the excessive protrusion of the jaw so as we have already said these ligaments they do not actively participate in the normal functioning of the tmj they just act as guide wires restricting and permitting some movements to the final component that is the muscles so we know the masticatory muscles that is the masseter temporalis lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid along with accessory muscles that surrounds the temporomandibular joint contract and relax in harmony so that the jaws function properly so let us see the uh, actions the elevators are temporalis masseter and medial pterygoid which helps to elevate the mandible in order to close the mouth then the depressors are lateral pterygoid and digastric the protruders inferior lateral pterygoid masseter and medial pterygoid the retruder is the temporalis that is the posterior fibers of temporalis helps to retract the protruded mandible it also helps in 
uh, side to side grinding movement. Then comes the medial trousse movement that is unilateral activation of medial pterygoid along with inferior lateral pterygoid. So the right medial pterygoid along with the uh, left lateral pterygoid helps to turn the chin to the left side as part of grinding movements. The vascular innervation. So the arterial blood supply is provided by branches of external carotid artery, predominantly the superficial temporal branch. And then it is also contributed by ascending pharyngeal artery and branches of maxillary artery. And for the condyle, it receives its blood supply through the marrow spaces, that is the feeder vessels from inferior alveolar artery. Now, the blood supply to the TMJ is only superficial, that is, there is no blood supply inside the capsule. And the TMJ actually takes its nourishment from the synovial fluid. Now, the synovial fluid is secreted from specialized endothelial cells that forms a synovial lining surrounding the internal surfaces of the cavities. And this synovial fluid fulfills the metabolic requirements of the non-vascular articular surfaces of the joint. And it also facilitates smooth jaw movements by reducing friction and providing lubrication. Thus, the synovial fluid acts as a lubricant and shock absorber. Coming to the neural innervation. So most of the innervation is provided by the auriculotemporal nerve. And additional innervation is provided by deep temporal and mesentric nerves. So all these are branches of a mandibular division of the fifth cranial nerve. That's a trigeminal nerve. So let us have a recap of the temporomandibular joint anatomy. So this is the temporomandibular joint, the lower compartment that is the mandibular component, that's the mandibular condyle, which is convex in all direction and it is wider mediolaterally than anterior posteriorly. This is the lower compartment which articulates with the upper compartment that is the glenoid fossa or the mandibular or articular fossa. So you can see here and then there is the uh, articular tubercle which is a bony projection and this is the articular eminence. So next coming to the uh, fibrous capsule. So this is a thin sleeve of tissue completely surrounding the joint extending from the circumference of the cranial surface to the neck of the mandible. And this is reinforced laterally by the temporomandibular joint ligament. So you can see here the lateral ligament. So TMJ ligament along with the capsule helps in limiting the movements of the mandible. Next coming to the biconcave fibrocartilaginous structure that is the articular disc which is located between the condyle and the temporal bone. We have said that the center intermediate zone where there is uh, no neurovascular structures and it has got anterior and posterior bands. And this is biconcave fibrocartilaginous structure and the lack of the neurovascular structure shows that there is considerable reaction force along this portion of the joint. And we have already discussed the functions of articular ducts that is it helps in reducing the stress, it aids in directing the synovial fluid and it also accommodates both the hinging and gliding movements. Thus, we have completed discussing the functional anatomy. So I have not gone deeper into TMJ anatomy because this much is enough for this topic. Next topic to be discussed is biomechanics of TMJ, which we will be continuing in our next session. So thank you all for watching this session. I hope you have followed this uh, TMJ anatomy. And if you have liked the session, please do hit the like button and also share my video. If you are new to this channel, Cross the Hub, please do subscribe and support Prostha Hub. If you have any queries or feedbacks, you can comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail ID. So it's a bye from Prostha Hub until our second session.